I hope you're ready. You brought it. For you. Well, you're, you're, you're you going to start it. it. <laughs> I was so excited, Wendy, and I'm telling you, now I'm a little apprehensive after you told me all the stuff you stuffed into here, man. <laughs> I didn't get you know, that, that vaporizer. didn't get me very high at all, but uh, I suspect this is going to... That should do the trick. Cheers. Thank you for Cheers. bringing this, Wendy. <laughs> We're about to get high now. Hey everybody, welcome to High Rollers. I'm your host, Derek Gilman, and together we're going to explore the world of cannabis connoisseurship. The tools, the techniques, the rituals, the details to help you maximize the enjoyment of your cannabis experience. Today, we're going to explore the Humboldt County mystique. What makes cannabis from Humboldt so special? Here to help us on our magical journey of discovery, is Wendy Kornberg of Sunnibus Farms. How are you doing, Wendy? Doing good, how are you? Thanks so much for joining us here on High Rollers. It's great to have you here. Uh, and I'm looking forward to diving into what you brought here today. Um, so tell us exactly what you do. Well, I am a small farmer in Humboldt County. I'm a second generation from there. We've got our little core team, family run and operated farm on the banks of the Eel River yep. in Southern Humboldt in the Benbow Valley. Second generation. Mm -hmm. So you know Humboldt as well as anybody, I imagine. I do, I grew up there. Yeah, far out. Um, and you and growing cannabis in Humboldt. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, I tease the audience here. You know, Humboldt has this, this legendary status. You know, when I was growing up, you know, if somebody said they had a bag of something from Humboldt, everyone's eyes just lit up and was just like, oh, okay, yeah. it, let's dive into it. Um, what makes it so special? Is it the place? Is it how it's grown? It's all of the above, really. So, okay. I mean, Humboldt County really is the first cannabis brand. There was weed and there was Humboldt, Humboldt weed. Right? And it was like Humboldt Green was what it was called. Yeah. And um, I think a big part of it is we're in such an isolated community that it's really a very special place for cannabis because we have really clean air. We have really clean water. We have a really unique geology, the way that the mountains have come up and just created all these microclimates. Yeah. And yet all of them are kind of in this crazy banana belt that is just really climatized for cannabis. We don't have a lot of mold issues. We have these cool breezes that still come through. We've got all kinds of different rocks and minerals in the soil that are naturally there. Yeah. Um, and then I think a big part of it too is back, you know, in the 70s and 80s when cannabis was really starting to be cultivated heavily in the hills of Humboldt, mm -hmm. people still had to hide it. You know, we had camp, we had the guys hanging out of helicopters. One sure. of my earliest frightening memories was looking out from our deck at a guy in a helicopter with a gun strapped on his side and he had his like aviator sunglasses on here. and he was flipping everybody off. I was, I was a kid, I was like five years old. And he was like, mm. And wow. it was just, it was a very frightening time to be, you know, growing up in that area. And yet, you know, everybody still was gonna do what they were gonna do. So mm -hmm. people went out into the woods. And um, the interesting thing now is that as we learn more about living soils and regenerative farming and the type of climate and soil really actually that cannabis wants to grow in it wants to grow in a fungally dominant soil which is what we generally find in old growth forests sure so we were cultivating in these soils that were just prime for cannabis and because you didn't have clones and you didn't have seed banks and you didn't have stores to go in and buy little babies and have all this you know what's the hypiest new strain to get yeah, it was so like you just always did your own seed projects so you know you swapped with your neighbors everybody grew the genetics out we picked out the best ones and you're touching on a lot of just critical points here and, yeah. you're, and you're working through a few of them you know obviously sunabus farms you're growing full sun yes. for starters right we do 
but it's it's the soil, it's this terroir, mm -hmm. as it's being called nowadays, right? Right. You know, all these these factors that you were talking about, the, the, the cleanliness of the water, but also the source of the water, how mm -hmm. it's interacting with these other minerals, right? Um, you also touched on um, regenerative growing, because I think that's something that you're becoming, you know, and Sunibus Farms is becoming known for, uh, is, is the way that you're growing this cannabis. There's the place, there's the Humboldt, um, but then also this, 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 this technique, this, this new way of growing, it's just kind of an old way of growing yeah. that's kind of coming back. Uh, explain it to us a little bit, will you please? Um, so when I first heard the term regenerative cannabis, regenerative farming, I actually it's a think it was. too, right? Regenerative. Regenerative, <laughs> yes. Rege don't say that with cotton mouth, regenerative. <laughs> um, so when I first heard regenerative farming, it was at the Emerald Cup and they were giving out the first regenerative farm award. And I was like, okay, I don't know what, what's regenerative farming? And the person next to me was like, I don't know. And I had to Google and I was like, oh, interesting. Okay, so regenerative farming is basically returning organic material to the soil was the simplest definition I could find. And okay. I just kind of went, well, isn't that just farming? I mean, what else do we do? And I really had to think about industrial agriculture and I had to go, oh, okay, cornfields in, Oklahoma. So this is in contrast to this other exactly. technique that's been going on in commercial ag for just for decades now. Exactly. And even when we talk about indoor growing with cannabis, like in my opinion, people are like, oh, I have a regenerative indoor. I'm like, you can't. It's not possible. That It is an oxymoron. It doesn't work. I'm sorry. You it's can... about sustainability. Yeah. It's about using the, the inputs that you have available to you on your farm or, yes. or, or growing those inputs, right? Exactly. It's called closing your loops. Okay. So when we think about an open loop, if you made a circle and you have a start and you have a finish and they're not connected. But if you close that loop, now you have a circle that's contained. So you close your loops on your farm. So if you're going to use water, you want it to be rainwater catchment because that's coming from the sky and going back in a circle, right? Okay, if I use municipal water, that's not, that, that's back outside the loop now. Exactly. Plants that are grown this way, they're, they're much more robust, they're more vigorous. Uh, they the uptake nutrients better. They uptake nutrients that they use less nutrients yep. in th that they uptake. They use less water. Yeah. It's just, it's pest pressures are not really such an issue when you have a really, really healthy plant and all of these things are working all in synchronicity in the sure. soil and on the foliar. It's, it's cool. But as a connoisseur. Yes. How but does let's it get, affect the end product? But let's get down <laughs> to the real reason <laughs> why we care. Yeah. All right. So what we have noticed without a shadow of a doubt, is that trichome production is increased, mm -hmm. terpene production is increased, terpene variety appears to be increased. I didn't do a side-by-side, -side, so I can't say that for certain. Okay. Um, and it's just, it's just got a different feeling to it, too. More higher trichome content, mm -hmm. higher terpene content, and perhaps a more diverse terpene content. Now we're talking the stuff I like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Because that's the magic. Yeah. That's the flavor. You know, it's those terpenes that are influencing those effects. And you know, and, and, and the more terpenes, the more diverse range of terpenes, you're getting those nuances in those exactly. flavors. You're getting that true character coming out, right? And it's amazing to me, too, when you get down into those, you know, the sesquiterpenes and the, the really minimal ones that you're like, oh, it's like a 0.03%. Like, does that really make a difference? Mm-hmm. But then you smoke it and you're like, oh my gosh, it really makes a difference. Turns out like, it does. It's in those minute amounts, okay? Yeah. They're all playing their role, okay? Either either individually or together with the others, right? Exactly. So you brought some it's samples cool. of what you do here today, I right? I did. <laughs> I'm getting anxious here talking about all these terps and trikes <laughs> and... Let's start by checking out some of these flowers you brought. I'm like a variety junkie. Like I just, I want one of everything. Killer, and I, I like you. love it. <laughs> <laughs> My husband hates it. You know, how many did you bring here today? You got one, two, um, three, four, see. five, six, seven, eight. You got nine different varieties. Well, these two are the same, but oh, okay. they're different phenotypes. I just counted nine bags, okay. But yes, eight different varieties. But two, um, two, there were two different phenos. Yeah. How cool. So you're growing everything from seed. We don't do everything from everything? seed anymore. Okay. I like growing from seed. I really enjoy 
starting them and just it's they're like they become my little babies like I carry them through life and Entire you know you process. watch them get huge and you're just like oh my gosh this was so cool you take this little stone yeah and you bring it to life you and take even it from this inanimated thing to this little sprout that becomes this huge tree, tree. that we consume yeah. and then it binds with us right yep. Um, and even the seeds, I even love that, like some of them are tiny and you're like, how is this gonna be the same size sprout as this big one? And yet it amazing. does, it's so cool. Yeah, see, oh, I love that. This is great. Um, it, looks a, it looks a little leafy, Wendy. It, if you don't mind me saying, I'm gonna take is, this out of here, yes. cool? It is a little leafy. Let's see what we got going on. So when we store for our head stash, when I store for my head stash, I don't trim it ahead of time because this is part of my process. I enjoy it. It stores better on the stick. You don't have to use the Bovitas, which... The little humidity packs. The humidity okay. packs, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think those do okay if you're storing like a personal eighth or something, but when mm -hmm. you get up into bigger bags, I just feel like wonky things happen. I don't really... The, the stick does great. The stick is the humidity control, so you don't sure. need to mess with it. And then the leaves that are, you know, this is how we dry and cure, is we keep our water leaves on for the most part. And um, it just, it, again, it helps prevent the um, trichome loss. It helps prevent terpene loss. It's just, it Effectively, gets Effectively, every time the flower gets touched, it degrades a little. Exactly. From the time it's been harvested, you know, all through all the steps. And if you can minimize some of those steps, right? Then yep. it's just, you have a more pristine product that, that you end up with. Plus for me too, when I think about it, I'm like, you know, there's a, there's, there's a beauty to being able to take this and just trim it down and, you know, you're experiencing as you're cutting it, you, you start getting the smells and it starts, you know, the terpenes are being released. And so there's this whole pre... Um, a pre-consumption ritual exactly. to a certain extent, yes, right? Exactly. Tell us what, what kind of scissors you use in here. I use the Fiskars and I usually just, you know, take off the water leaves and then I don't do a huge... I don't know, I see people now that trim it so close and I'm like, oh man, look at all the stuff that you move, miss and lose when you do that. So, I, yeah, yeah. And you trim a little too close, you end up shaving off some of those trichomes that you've yep. been, <laughs> so been that's, trying to preserve. I mean, you know, that's what I do. <laughs> it's almost got a, it almost has like a mango. And then we have this one that was the more purple pheno. This one has a more berry, uh, tr had, had that huckleberry scent to it, but it disappears faster. So it's harder to keep that preserved for some reason. And it was a really, it was, it was what I really liked about the original one that I got. I had one male and one female that smelled so much like huckleberries. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, it didn't come through on the F1s or the F2s and uh, it, I've been chasing it ever since and I don't know if I'm ever gonna find it And again. it's kind of curious, you know, how that, that, that aroma favorite. profile changes from that living plant yeah. to once you've harvested it, to what you end up with either after you've dried it and then ultimately after you've cured it. Right. Okay, some of those aromas remain intact, others kind of get lost through that process, and right? And then when you smoke it, and sometimes it has that same flavor, and sometimes it's something totally different yet again. Uh, so this is the garlic diesel is from um, Emerald Triangle Genetics, I think is what they were called. I'd never heard of them before, but this guy was coming through the Emerald Cup a few years back mm -hmm. with these seeds, and I'm like, this is the first year we grew it last year. I think the seeds sat around for a couple of years, so I didn't touch them. I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing with these. I gotta tell so. you, Wendy, you know, over the last couple of minutes we've been having our company. I know, can you smell it? <laughs> Since you opened Wafty? the bag, it worked its way over yeah. and started, you know, working its way up my nostrils. Yeah, is this one Garlic is like... Garlic diesel. Right? Oh, look at the color on this. It's beautiful. They I did mean, it's everything. almost black, it's so purple in some of these yeah. spots here, right? Yep. It was a beautiful one to grow, um, and it's just, I can't, I still can't quite figure out what that smell is. It's like fruity, but garlicky, That's but fuel-y, but none of the above really, but kind of all of them a little bit. <laughs> this is interesting. If it weren't for that fruitiness, the, what's, what's when I, I give it just the slightest little pinch mm -hmm. here to open it up, and there's this, there's a lot of layers in here. Right. There's a light skunkiness in there. Yep. It almost reminds, yeah, this, this reminds me of uh, stuff from like a 
couple decades back almost, except for that fruitiness component Except for the to fruitiness, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, but everything else that's going on in there. Outrageous, oh, this is nice. Isn't that cool? It's it's really, it's one of the ones that I, for, when we were growing it, we're like, mm, I'm not sure about this. My husband was like, garlic, diesel, really? I'm like, let's try it out, you know? <laughs> and now I'm like, oh, oh it's really special. <laughs> So this is my little Pax Vaporizer. And personally, I'm an extreme lightweight when it comes to THC. Mm -hmm. So, you know, back in the day, like we used to roll the big fatties and pass it around the party. And I, for some reason, like as I got older, my tolerance just like took a nosedive. So that? for me, like, I like just a little bit because if I light a joint, then it gets stale and I don't really, you know. Sure. You want to consume. You want to consume what you break apart in that in that session. Yeah, exactly. Okay, you, want to, you want to trim it. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing something here. I'm yeah. seeing something here, <laughs> Wendy. You only want to trim that nug when you're ready to smoke it. You're only breaking apart when you're ready to smoke it, and just the amount that you're going to use. Yep. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, it's it's a uh, you know yeah it's just part of the part of my ritual and part of what I do and. Yeah, I, you're you're maintaining your trikes to this point, you're maintaining your terpenes up until the point, you know, starting to break it up. Yeah. Right? And uh, terpenes for me, like, I, I love terpenes. I think that- You don't say. Part of the, yeah, <laughs> part of the beauty of cannabis is that, we you know, I mean, like, it. right, but it's, isn't it so cool? I mean, like, I don't know. Terpenes are the coolest thing in the world with cannabis because terpenes are in everything, right? Mm -hmm. They're everywhere. But yet you go to lavender and it's like linalool. That's what you get, that's it. Right, you go to black pepper it's and- It's singularly this. You get yeah. a lemon, you get that plenty of limonene. Right. Oh man, it's there, all right? You go to right. a pine tree, you get, you get your pinings. Exactly, and then you go to cannabis and you're like, oh my gosh, it's one plant and yet it has all of them or you know, a good balance of a bunch of them. Blends and, and yeah, and combinations and recombinations and- And then you start learning the names and you're just like, what is Nerilidol? <laughs> And what is that in? And what does that do? That's what makes cannabis connoisseurship so fascinating, okay? Is just that differentiation between the product. There's just so many, there's the flavors, the aromas, the effects. Yeah. Okay, you know, there's wine connoisseurs, cigar connoisseurs. Um, I'm sure they're having a good time, but I think a lot of that stuff is, is a little narrower than, than the potential of cannabis connoisseurship. Wine, I would actually probably disagree with you a little bit, but um, <laughs> I happen to love wine. Yeah. Um, I like actually, we grew up, you know, drinking Cabernet. So it's like, I remember the first time I ever had Merlot and I was like, wow, that is so sweet. Oh my gosh. Have you found wine to have the same spectrum of potential in aroma and flavor yes. that cannabis can have. I, oh, really? I, okay. So, that's just, so yeah. that, that's just my ignorance of wine. For, for high-end wines, mm -hmm. so I mean, I've had some Cabernet Sauvignons that were just mind-blowing where it's very similar to cannabis. You smell it and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm getting like that garlic diesel where you're like, I'm getting hints of this and that and oh, oh, With and there's that. Layers. And layers and layers and layers. And then you drink it and it's just like, again, you get layers upon layers upon layers where it's like, if it's a really good wine, mm -hmm. I mean, you could sip on that glass of wine all night long and have something different hitting at different okay, points. Okay, maybe you convince me a little bit, Wendy. <laughs> maybe just, just a little bit. Just gotta get the good wine, good wine. Uh, so tell us about okay. the tool you brought here. So yeah, so the Pax Vaporizer, I have it set for um, one of the lowest settings, I think I do. Comes, I think it has like a phone app and stuff too, but I'm not, I mean, I'm a farmer, really. I, I like digging in the dirt and talking with plants, so when we start having to make my phone talk to my joint, I'm not, <laughs> not the happiest That's person. That's a bit much. It's a bit the, much. The, 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 the phone's watching everything else. I don't right. need to watch exactly what I'm consuming, how Ooh. much and when either, okay? <laughs> not to go down the conspiracy hole, but that's interesting. Yeah, uh, no, yeah. no conspiracy holes here. <laughs> uh, so basically, it's just, this is an older version. They have like the newer ones that are a little thinner and sleeker, but And here on High Rollers, great. we have done a lot of joint smoking. I think this might be the first vaporizer we brought onto High Rollers. Oh. And so for those people watching who aren't entirely familiar, let's just, you know, briefly without going into too yeah. much detail, you know, what, what is vaporizing? 
So vaporizers, basically, they're taking a lower heat. Mm -hmm. So instead of combusting with a flame, which is going to be full combustion, and you're burning your plant material, you're burning your chlorophyll, your leaves, anything that's in there is going to catch Everything. fire and burn, basically. <laughs> yeah. So what this does is it heats it up to a specific temperature where your terpenes are vaporizing and your cannabinoids are vaporizing, but your flower material, the actual plant material, stays intact. And vaporizing, that's effectively, you know, it's, that's when this solid converts into a gas. Yes. Right? You know, you got these trichome heads, with, it's got all the magic, all those terpenes and cannabinoids. It hits that right temperature, right? Yep. And then, you know, a certain boiling point and volatizes exactly. and becomes available to inhale. Exactly. Push the little button right there, and it kind of vibrates when you push it, and mm -hmm. this thing starts glowing. And eventually it'll turn green, which means that it's up to heat and green it's ready go. to go. Green, green means go. And I believe it actually vibrates too once it's ready. So if you're, yep, there it goes. Okay, so, it's so if you're not paying attention, well. it's like. Bzz, bzz. Nice. Well, show so, us how, show right, us how so this just, thing works. And that's it. I mean, there's not very much smoke, but you can taste. So you the loaded a bowl in yep. there, that little pile that you broke yep. apart, you know, which was just a fraction of a gram, it looked like. Um, how many hits are we gonna get out of this? More or less. I don't know. Again, I'm a lightweight, so I usually take two and then I like forget and I go do something else. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I come back to it, I'm like, well, I'll take that out and do trick. something different. But you wanna okay. try? Yes, please. I am ready. And it's different, right? You don't really know. You're like, am I getting anything in? Am I not? Like, what's happening here? So I did notice when I first started using it, there is a bit of a learning curve of like, how big of a hit am I actually taking? And the reason, it's because it's specifically what you said. You're not feeling anything. Yep. It's not You're hot. You're not feeling it on the throat, yeah. Super tasty. Right? Um, what did... If you were to compare, now we talked about flavor, how would you compare the effects of, you know, using the little vapor device here versus smoking a joint? You notice any difference? I think I get higher off joints. Yeah? Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure whether that just, again, goes back to what I'm used to, where it's like, you know, you know, our parents and ladies, like, <gasps> yep, so tell me, George, <laughs> now's your day going. I'm like, you know, we don't do that anymore. We know yeah. we don't have to hold it in like that. Right. But um, I feel like I still, with joints, just have this, habit of, you know, you take a really big hit and... Uh, Hold it in for a second or two, <laughs> yeah. let it go, yeah. Um, I think it's, personally, I think it's, um, it's what we were touching on before, on those uh, boiling points, mm -hmm. on how, you know, the vaporizing doesn't combust it, but, you know, a joint obviously does. Right. We know everything's getting to its boiling point through that joint. Right. One way or another, either through that hot air coming through or through that cherry that it's you know, going to burn it at some point. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily the case with vaporizing, depending on the, the temperature at which you're vaping. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. That and I think that, that really you know, dictates that, that experience. Yeah, I would agree. And I also think that because your terpenes are the first ones to, to vapor, to turn into vapor, that you're getting, like, that's what, I, I love the first hit, because it's like, you get all Amazing. that, you get that terp profile first, where you're just like, oh, yay. And it lingers on the mouth in a nice way, too. Right, and you don't have that ashtray breath. You don't have that, <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> no, no, no. the roach breath, oh. Roach breath, right, <laughs> yeah. So the other way that I like to consume, and I found that this is particularly true for women, is that kind of doing a, a micro micro dosing consistently helps keep um, just like a, a more mellow mood. I mean, yeah, you've got it, you have an assortment here. Yeah. So, um, and know. so when I use all of them all the time. So basically like when I get up in the morning, I wash my face and I use our face oil. And this is actually um, high in THCA. This is the same thing, but just in a roll-on bottle. And we've had really amazing results with this being anti-aging. And then it also, I formulated it specifically to be um, high in THCA, which science is showing to be really relevant for pre-skin cancerous and non-melanoma skin cancers. Muscle, this, the muscle salve, awesome. 
you know, roll-up stick here, I see. Yeah, we did that because um, we had a lot of arthritic patients coming back at the beginning. Mm. Check this one out. This is the mending salve. So this is meant for psoriasis and eczema specifically, but it's, um, women tend to love that one too because it also has ro essential rose oil in it. Yeah, good for muscle aches, better for skin conditions, skin rashes, things like and that. So people are like, well, why do you want to put, you know, your cannabis in a bath and then you're draining it all out? I'm like, because your whole dermal layer can just, just need to hit soak everywhere. it up. And oh, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. But yeah, no real psychoactive effects on that either. Again, it's just... Um, it's tasty. It's tasty. Okay, so you get the idea. I'm a formulator. I come up with these creative ideas and then I find people who want to help me go down these crazy crazy routes and this happened to be a friend of mine uh, named Stefan Johnson conspirators and in your madness yes, he, he's, he's <laughs> nice one of my that. conspirators <laughs> and he was doing pressing mm -hmm. we would give him some of our fresh flour and he would sit there and he would dry it for anywhere between 12 and 36 hours and once he hit the 12 hour mark he had this like hydraulic hand press <laughs> so it was like almost no heat whatsoever only the heat of the pressure Squeeze that would it do it yeah and high times had a pre-roll category mm. and i was like I really like that High Times cup. I really want one of those cups. Stefan, do you want to do a pre-roll with me? Let's do an infused pre-roll for the medically infused category. And he was like, okay, sure. I'm like, we have like three days <laughs> to get these done. We need 58 joints and here's what we want to do. And so we sat and we kind of brainstormed and what Delicious. we came up with was this, which is, I believe this one actually had two different types of flour and then it's infused with keef. Keef infused flour. Keef infused flour, because flour you, isn't enough. I love you Humboldt people, okay? <laughs> because there's a lot of cultivators around that are actually keefing their flour before they sell it, meaning they're they're putting yeah. it through some sort of tumbler, right, to get to get these trichomes off, and then they go and they sell this keef flour, they sell the keef separately. You're putting the keef back in. We're putting the keef back in. Love it. Yes. All right. So keef infused flour, we have two different types of rosin. So there's a dab at the top and then there's one down here and they're different flavors. Okay. And then at the bottom, this little part is actually a CBD dab. So what happens is if you're smoking your joint yeah. and it's a lot of THC in there, especially for people like me, and all of a sudden you realize you're way too high you just break it at the bottom, yeah. and then you just light the CBD end. And what we're finding is that CBD will balance out your THC and make it, I don't, I don't necessarily think it brings you down, yeah. but it just makes it more maintainable. Cuts the edge off. Exactly. Takes you from that state of, ah, uh, to, to, okay, I think, okay. I, can, I, think I can cope. <laughs> I think I can cope. <laughs> yep. I hope you're ready. You brought it. For you. Well, you, you're, you're you, gonna you, start it. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited, Wendy, and I'm telling you, I'm a little apprehensive after you told me all the stuff you stuffed into here, man. <laughs> I didn't get you know, that, that vaporizer didn't get me very high at all, but uh, I suspect this is gonna. That should do the trick. Cheers! Thank you for Cheers. bringing this, Wendy. <laughs> We're about to get high now. And I know people are like, oh, you, everybody needs their own joint. I'm like, well, you know, there's something about just passing it back and forth, though. When, it's got, when it's got three grams of <laughs> rosin and keef right. in there, I don't, know, uh, I, don't, um, I don't know how well I do with that by myself. And like I said, much this as is I'd like to try. the mini version, right? <laughs> but the mini version. It's a relatively even burn there. It's close. Now it was tasted. Now that, that... That's got some potency to it. Yes. I can just tell, a little. I mean, it's already, you know, it's already starting to get on top of me. Just those first, you know, a couple <laughs> hits I did to get it lit. This is going to be an interesting journey. Do you remember the first time you got high? I can remember the first time I tried to get high. Out, let's hear it. All Out right, it. so I was, um, my parents should not ever watch this, okay? Uh, <laughs> I think I was about 13 years old, somewhere in that early teenage year. And um, I had a couple of my girlfriends over and we all decided, we're like, we should all try and get high, this will be fun. 
And my house was known very much for being the cool house. Okay. We had the candy drawer, and next to the candy drawer was the weed drawer. The adult's version of the candy drawer. <laughs> Sounds like a fun house to me. Yeah, it was pretty cool. <laughs> and so we got into the weed drawer, and I... Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I made a pipe out of a chunk of wood by drilling a hole in the top of it and a Whoa. hole in the side. Innovative at, a, at an early age you were, Wendy. <laughs> huh? Yeah, because none of us knew how to roll weed, and yeah. I don't think my parents used pipes. They all just rolled joints. So I, I was like, okay, I knew my friends were coming over. We had this plan. We're going to get high, and I'm like, Whoa. Comfortable with the drill? Yeah, you know, my dad was a con general contractor, yeah. so I went in and I took this little block of like one by one wood and I like drilled a small hole down the center of it and then I drilled a bigger hole in the top and then I took a, um, I took a screen out of the faucet tip <laughs> to make the bowl part. Oh my God, this is hysterical. I haven't thought about this in so long. And uh, so we got into the weed drawer, we got the weed, I got my little homemade pipe and we went up to our pond and we sat down and we tried to light it and I, I recall the, the pipe itself because it was unfinished wood actually oh. catching fire. Mm. <laughs> and we didn't know how much to smoke or anything. We had a little tiny nug between the you're, three of us. You're smoking the pipe as much as you're smoking the weed at this point. Pretty much. <laughs> we did not get high. I just remember all this being like, okay, why is this such a big deal? Because that didn't seem like a big deal to me. Do you feel anything? Right. right. <laughs> we kept waiting and waiting. <laughs> Other than that, the, like the first time I really got high, I don't really remember. Okay. You remember when you first started paying attention to the differences in the quality? I mean, you grew up in yeah. Humboldt. I mean, you, you, were, you were around the killer stuff all the time. It was really when we started getting into other people's weed and realizing, like, I think my first trip to, um, the, to the High Times Cup in San Bernardino and really discovering like you know people like oh this is this amazing indoor and i remember smoking it and just being like wow i am super high and i'm so paranoid i can't be here right now and it was i mean and part of that was you know culture and you know being like people taking pictures of you in a booth selling weed i was like oh this is so being not high okay in a crowd yeah is it can be iffy yeah. You know, especially depending on what you're smoking. Right. You know, you're smoking some sativa, you know, one of those old land races. Shh, paranoia City. Yeah. You're there. <laughs> and I don't know, I don't remember what I was smoking. I just remember it was one of those joints that got passed around and I was just like, oh dear, what have I done? <laughs> and at that point, it was definitely, for me, there was a, um, there was an energetic feeling that was different. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I don't like this. And I'm like, I don't know if it's because I'm in the middle of a parking lot and there's tons of people milling around and people are taking pictures and I'm a little anxious about this whole situation. Um, and I just signed my name on a piece of paper that says I'm a big fat felon. Uh, so this was like, you know, perfect storm for paranoia and anxiety. Sure. But uh, as time went on and I was smoking more, you know, other strains from other growers and oh, this is my awesome you know, indoor from wherever. And I realized that I just, I don't like indoor. It doesn't make me feel the same. Mm -hmm. And I found that with almost all outdoor and almost all sun grown, um, at least from the people that are small craft growers, I always feel really good. Like I can get too high and still be okay. But if I get too high on indoor, I'm just like, and I'm going to bed now, <laughs> I'm done. The plant, grown in those indoor conditions leads a different life. Yeah. Um, doesn't often have that same grower plant connection. Right. That energy exchange, um, that ability for it to, to, to be what it wants to be, you know, to, to, to fulfill its destiny. Um, and that's something I've noticed, you know, again, to, get, to bring it back to Humboldt, um, is that connection that that you guys have with the plants. You know, there's almost something spiritual going on. Oh, there's you know, definitely could, something spiritual going on. Could you touch on that a little for me? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's one of those things that like we didn't really talk about a whole lot until more recently when spirituality has become more acceptable. But there's something, you know, when you, when you really love what you do and you really love where you do it and you're really just like, what a blessed life I actually have 
it transfers through. It, it just, it absolutely does. And it's like the cannabis that's grown in those conditions, there is, you, especially if you started it from seed, it's like you loved this thing throughout this whole area. And like I said, we've had the people that are like, I don't like outdoor, but like, this is different. Happy growers grow happy smoke. There you go. <laughs> angry growers grow angry smoke. Yep. You know, uh, paranoid growers grow <laughs> smoke. It makes paranoid. Yeah. Yeah, and when you get into like even, you know, and, and again, it is, it's, it is about craft growing and it's about one of the natural farming sayings is what's, it's a question actually, what's the best thing you can put on your plant every day? The grower's shadow. And that's just being there and being present with your plant every single day and just knowing what's happening and how it goes. And, um, and again, just being able to be like, I mean, I, I've grown indoor. It wasn't the greatest. I, I didn't really like being in there. The lights felt weird, the buzzing and the noise. It's a different and vibe, it's, it's a different energy. The plants were there to do a job and the job was to grow buds and, and be done fast. And it's just like, I mean, I love being out in the middle of my patch and putting on music and laying down and just like soaking up the sun for a little bit. And They're your you know, girls. Yeah. You know? Staring at their roots and just being like, oh, you're so happy right now. We birthed, <laughs> we birthed them, you know, to a large degree, right? Yeah. Wow. Um, I think this, uh, this crazy potent joint you decided <laughs> to bring along here, Wendy, <laughs> uh, got us pretty loaded, huh? <laughs> yep, doing pretty good. Uh, hey, everybody. I hope you had a good time here on High Rollers today. Uh, hope you learned a little bit more about the Humboldt mystique, about sun grown, uh, about some of the killer genetics and flower that's coming out of Humboldt, um, about some of these neat products, <laughs> just to kind of help you uh, keep a nice homeostasis and a balance throughout the day on your high. Um, and look forward to you guys joining us next time on High Rollers. Wendy and I, uh, I think we're gonna make a valiant effort to finish this thing. It's nearly halfway <laughs> done. You mentioned there's a different flavor here at the middle point. Um, so yeah, we're gonna give that a go and uh, yeah, see you guys next time. This thing's potent. It's got a little bit in it, not too bad. <laughs> it's got a little bit in it. Yeah, that's putting it lightly. <laughs>